Good morning, everybody. Good morning, all you magnificent melon heads, and happy Thursday. Today is December 7th, 2023. The top story this morning is the Bank of Japan, and the end is nigh. How's that for a doomer tagline for you? The end is nigh, and by the end, I'm talking about the end of negative interest rates. We got some comments from Bank of Japan governors last night. Basically preparing people for an end to negative rates, that's their overnight rate, as soon as maybe this month. Um, That caught a lot of people off guard in the middle of the night. We're seeing the Japanese yen is surging against the dollar this morning. Interest rates on Japanese government bonds are surging. That's even as interest rates here in the States are falling. Well, what's going on is people are starting to say, hey, you know, the, the the Bank of Japan has been this anchor, if you will, the, the, the anchoring low interest rates around the world, even as the Fed and as the European Central Bank and the Canadians, everybody has been raising rates for the last year and a half, almost two years now. Bank of Japan has been pretty much holding steady. They've let the rates rise a little bit. I mean, they went from nothing point nothing to nothing point seven where they're at right now, all right? They did get as high as almost 1% earlier this year before falling back down, but now they're spiking again. And this is important because we've talked about this before on this channel. I had Michael Gayed from Lead Lag Report came on the channel a few months ago, and we talked about the potential unwinding of the yen carry trade and why that's so important. Because interest rates have been so cheap in Japan for so long that a lot of institutions have been able to go over to Japan and borrow yen for next to nothing, then convert those yen to U.S. dollars and use those dollars to buy U.S. assets, stocks, bonds, treasuries, whatever they want to buy with it. And that's been a pretty good trade because the interest rate on those yen is so low that they're making more money on the price appreciation of those assets, more than enough to pay the interest on the yen that they owe, Certainly, as the dollar has been surging over the last year or two also, you've also got a currency uh, tailwind helping out with that trade because the dollars that they traded those yen for have gone up in value, even as the assets they bought with those dollars went up in nominal U.S. dollar terms. So the yen carry trade has been very profitable. But what happens if the yen starts to go up in value like is happening right now. What happens if the cost to borrow those yen starts to go up? Well, now those same institutions are starting to see the profit or starting to see the arbitrage go away. Now they might be tempted to sell those assets they bought here in the U.S., convert those dollars back in the yen, and pay back the yens. In other words, cover their yen shorts. And so that's not all happening all at once. I I, want to temper my doomism here a little bit think of this more as pulling the plug on the bathtub right there is not this tidal wave this sudden deluge where everybody dumps their dollars and buys yen all at the same time but you are starting the drain you're letting the level slowly drop and i think that's a pretty good analogy for what a sudden rise in the yen and a rise in japanese government bond interest rates could result in here in the states so it's a very important thing to keep an eye on The Bank of Japan Japan has set the low bar for interest rates for years, and they're saying that bar is about to start rising, even as the U.S. and Europe are having rumors of easing very soon. Also going on this morning, we got some trade data out of China, and it's not very good. China's imports year over year were down 0.6% for the month of November. Chinese consumer is not buying much at all. And keep in mind, those import numbers are being buoyed by the fact that the Chinese government is buying up oil like crazy right now. They're doing the opposite of the stupidity that we had last year where the U.S. was dumping the strategic petroleum reserve. Well, China has been filling theirs, buying tons and tons of oil. Well, even with all that oil buying, China's imports are still down year over year. And guys, remember what we're comparing to here. We're comparing to November of last year. Do you remember what was going on November of last year? The whole freaking country was locked inside. Zero COVID policy. Do you remember the the ridiculousness of the lockdowns in China last year? Which, uh, by the way, I'm sure had nothing to do with the bank runs and the mortgage boycotts that were going on in China this time last year. People who had already paid for homes 
and were sick of waiting for bankrupt developers to build them, even though they had to make mortgage payments on homes that didn't even exist yet. And then those people stopped paying their mortgages and then banks started failing. And when people started protesting at the banks, magically their COVID apps turned red and then cops in gym shorts showed up and started beating them up. Something I'd love to show you, but I'd get my channel demonetized again if I did that. So I can't show you that. So I'm sure that zero COVID policy had nothing to do with the collapse of real estate. Well, remember the grand reopening afterward? Oh, okay. They're rolling back zero COVID policy. And we are going to let the reopening happen. And the Chinese consumer, he's going to buy up all this oil. How's that going for you, oil? Oh, boy. Wow. And now here we are almost a year later and imports are down year over year. Chinese are buying less stuff now than they bought when they were stuck inside last year. Do you really think that Chinese economy is not collapsing? I know a lot of people are out there saying, oh, people have been calling for China to collapse for years. Well, that's just because China is going to collapse. The, the Chinese economy is going to collapse. It is collapsing. Real estate and property development is the economy in China, and it is no more. And we're starting to see that in the import data. Now, a silver lining to that big gray cloud, exports were up a half a percent year over year. That's got more to do with U.S. and European demand than it does with Chinese consumerism. Uh, that's after months and months of declines. So it's possible that ever so slight uptick in exports to the U.S. and to Europe, maybe that's a sign that the inventory restocking or, or the drawdown in inventory, I should say, is finally over. Maybe U.S. retailers are finally starting to increase their orders again. We should start to see that in freight. We should start to see that in trucking rates. So maybe that's a sign that we've finally shrunk our inventories enough and we're going to start expanding again. I'm just looking for the looking for the optimism here, folks. You know, I, I it has occurred to me that I, I cover the negative news a little bit more here on this channel. So some people have used the word doomer. So I'm, I'm I'm trying to find the silver lining here. Exports are up a half a percent. Ride that rocket, baby. Good for you guys. Um, also, we've got Blackstone Mortgage Trust, ticker BXMT. There was a report yesterday by short seller Muddy Waters, who basically said BXMT could have the entirety of their capital wiped out by the decline in commercial real estate and by bankruptcies and defaults in commercial real estate. They had an interview on CNBC yesterday and they published a report and BXMT was big down big yesterday. That's more trouble in the commercial real estate space. And that's a, you don't hear as much about BXMT. You hear a lot about BREIT, the Blackstone Real Estate Investment Trust. That's their big $64 billion fund that has throttled withdrawals. They haven't let everybody pull their money out for 13 months in a row now. Well, now they're talking about the BXMT, not the BREIT. That's their other commercial real estate one, but that focuses more on the mortgages, not the properties themselves. And that's the one that Muddy Waters is issuing their report on. We got Walmart CEO was out in the press yesterday warning about deflation and reverse repo watch. Reverse repos were up a little bit, but something to keep an eye on, guys. We got a tiny little uptick in repo a few days ago on Tuesday night. Not reverse repo, repo. And I, I want to emphasize, it was a tiny little uptick, $200 million. Not a whole heck of a lot of money, certainly not considering the $840 billion or $860 billion, whatever the current number is, in reverse repo. But somebody out there needed liquidity, and they went to the Fed for it. It was only overnight. It's a repurchase agreement. They pay it back the next day. But a surge in repos typically precedes economic calamity. And I just want to emphasize again, $200 million is not a surge in repo. It's just a tick up. But it's the first tick up that we have seen in years. And that's happening as the reverse repo is almost empty. Another thing you want to keep an eye on. With that, why don't we shrink my big melon of a head and see what's going on in the world. And while we're doing that, guys, don't forget that like button. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. And if you're new, subscribe to this channel. We do this every morning. Stocks are looking like they are up this morning. The S&P is up 15 points, about a third of 1% higher ahead of the opening bell. The Dow is also up 9 points, basically flat. Uh, but in the green, nonetheless, so there you go, 10 points up ahead of the opening bell. And the NASDAQ leading the way higher, two-thirds of a percent. 106 points to the upside for the NASDAQ ahead of the opening bell. So people are buying tech stocks again this morning. Number go up. 
The U.S. dollar, meanwhile, is heading lower. The Dixie is at 103.75. That's down 40 basis points this morning. This is being driven exclusively by that news at the BOJ. The yen is strengthening against the dollar, and the yen is, I believe, the second or the third largest input to the DXY math, the largest being the euro. With the yen strengthening against the dollar, that is sending the Dixie lower. Weaker dollar tends to buoy asset prices at the moment. Looking over at the bond market, we've got yields on the long end of the curve are up this morning. Yields on the short end are down modestly. The 30-year Treasury, 4.258. That's up 3.5 basis points. The 10-year is at 4.145, up 2.5 basis points. The 2-year, however, is down almost 2 points, 4.586. And the 1-month at 5.372. That's down a little bit. That's the first 5.37 I've seen on the 1-month in a while. So even those uh, short, even those T bills getting in on the lower rates now, albeit you know marginally fractions of, of a single percent. Looking over at the commodities board, gold is higher this morning. We've got February gold futures at two thousand fifty one. That's up about three dollars and sixty five cents. March silver futures at twenty four twenty four. That's up about a penny, eh, just barely in positive territory. Platinum and palladium are both up a couple of percent though. We've got platinum. Uh, January futures up two and a quarter percent. March palladium futures up three and a quarter percent. And even oil is up a little bit this morning. Uh, West Texas Intermediate January futures at $70.24. That's up 84 cents this morning or 1.2 percent higher. Oil finally catching a bid. It has been a brutal couple of days of oil. This chart is going back to about February of this year. Here was the announcement of the OPEC trade or the OPEC supply cuts and oil just fell Five, six days in a row afterward. We Okay, good. We got one little green candle up. We'll see where oil goes from here. Uh, guys, I just want to add, I mentioned this on a trade yesterday. Look at this level right here, right around between $65 and $68. That is the floor that OPEC has put on oil prices pretty much since the beginning of the year. Uh, maybe we make that one a little higher. We'll probably put it around $68. Watch that level. We did just get an announcement of a supply cut. If oil keeps heading lower, if we get into the high 60s and we stay there, we're probably going to get another supply cut from OPEC. They've done it every other time this year. OPEC has told us they want oil prices in the 80s, not in the 60s. So we'll see what they do if and when that happens. But this is a top story this morning. Traders pile into bets that the end of negative BOJ rate is near this is the biggest story in the world right now. Swaps show as much as a 45% chance of a December tweak. This came out of nowhere. Now they're saying negative rates may go away as soon as next week. Deputy Jimeno's remarks spur talk of a live December meeting, and a live meeting means we're going to make up our mind at the meeting, which means nothing is set in stone yet, but they're starting to prepare the market for a tweak to their yield curve control policy. Traders are rapidly increasing bets that the Bank of Japan will scrap the world's last negative interest rate regime as soon as this month, after the central bank's leaders indicated they could be preparing a shift in policy. The sell-off initially fueled by comments from BOJ Governor Kazuo Ueda and one of his deputies jolted financial markets in Tokyo and beyond, shattering a period of relative calm for Japan's bonds. A sharp strengthening of the yen and the biggest move in Japanese bond yields in a year served as a stark reminder to international investors that a major anchor for global borrowing costs may soon be dislodged. That last part's important. A major anchor for global borrowing costs may soon be dislodged. This will have ripple effects in the U.S. and Europe and everywhere else. This is the global low interest rate. If the floor is rising, that is going to affect everything else. UEDA told lawmakers in Parliament that his job was going to get more challenging from the year end helping fuel speculation of a near-term scrapping of the sub-zero rate. While a comment came in response to questions, his subsequent visit to Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's office to discuss his monetary policy stance seemed more like a staged move aimed at delivering a signal. Yet it was Deputy Governor Ryozo Himino's playing down of the adverse effects of a rate hike on Wednesday that was probably the most significant of the apparent communication cues from the central bank. Hamino's hypothesis for what might happen if the central bank ended, ended negative rates looked like a clear paving of the way toward that eventuality. The key question that remains is when it will take place. The BOJ meets on December 18th and 19th, followed by another policy gathering in January. 
And then meetings in March and April then follow after the results of next year's labor union pay negotiations emerge. So a lot of talk about tweaks to the yield curve control policy. There is BOJ Governor Kazuo Ueda right there. He took over in March. A lot of people thought he was going to be a hawk from day one. As soon as he took over in March, everybody was like, he was going to end yield curve control, start raising interest rates. Of course, right as he took over, U.S. banks started failing. And, well, raising interest rates during bank failures is sometimes viewed as ill-advised, although Jerome Powell didn't seem to think so. And so Japan paused or at least never really got off to the running start that a lot of people thought Ueda was going to do. They did tweak policy a little bit in July. That sent rates higher. They had since come down. Let's take a look at some of the reaction to this in the charts. All right, here is the U.S. dollar versus the Japanese yen. Now, when you see this chart rising, this is the yen weakening versus the dollar. When you see this chart falling, that is the yen strengthening versus the dollar. And look at this big red candle right here from last night. That is what happened when the BOJ governors made these statements. You saw a severe strengthening in the yen versus the dollar. And the USD JPY chart dropped by 2.40. It now takes 144 0.9 yen to make one dollar that's down from a high of about 151 and a half just a few weeks ago so the yen has been strengthening against the dollar quite a bit lately took a big step change down again that means more strengthening on this news you can also see this in the chart of the 10-year jgb or japanese government bond this has been rising pretty much all year i uh, want to point out here back in july this was when the Bank of Japan last tweaked their yield curve control policy. We saw a big step change up in 10-year Japanese government bond yields as borrowing costs in Japan started to rise. That set off this wave of higher rates in Japan. And again, when I say wave, this is relative, guys. We're talking about a move from one half of 1% to a high of 0.98%. So a half a percent to almost 1%. That's this big move in Japanese government bond yields. It doesn't seem like that much, but again, we're talking about the global anchor of interest rates. So with the floor rising, this does affect everything else. Now, starting right around Halloween, as U.S. bond yields started to fall, JGBs were dragged down with it. They started to head lower. And then last night on the news that Kuwait made these comments, you can see a big step change higher in 10-year Japanese government bond yields. So every all the charts are reacting to this in Japan right now. See where we go. They're saying this could happen as soon as December 18th and 19th, which is only a few days away. So that's a very sudden shift in tone from the central bank of the world's third largest economy. And meanwhile, let's take a look at some of this data. China's weak trade data signals more economic pain to come. Imports in dollar terms declined by 0.6% in November from 2022. Data defies expectations for strong performance at year end. China's imports unexpectedly shrank in November from a COVID hit period a year ago, while exports edged up from a low base, suggesting the nation's slowing economy still hasn't bottomed out. Imports in dollar terms declined 0.6% after clocking an improvement the previous month. That's according to official data released on Thursday. That was worse than economists' consensus for a 3.9% gain. So they were calling for almost a 4% increase in imports, Ended up with a 0.6% decrease in imports. Quite a disappointment. And guys, these are Chinese Communist Party figures. So if these numbers are allowed to be reported this bad, it's a good bet that the actual numbers are even worse. Now, when it comes to exports, though, that was actually a little bit better. Overseas shipments rose 0.5% from a year ago. That's slightly better than the consensus estimate of no change. And that marked the first year-over-year -year expansion since April. It's been a pretty bad year for exports in China. The resulting trade surplus was $68.39 billion. Now, uh, there's a couple of – oh, where was it? I had it. I had them highlighted here. Son of a gun. I lost it. I totally lost my train of thought on this one, guys. But long story short, imports are down year-over-year. -year. That is a incredibly profound statement because we're talking about a comparison – when everybody in the country was locked down. And the lockdowns last fall, guys, these were not your standard U.S.-Europe 2020 lockdowns. They were overwhelmingly draconian. Do you remember everybody was locked in the Foxconn factories in China last year and they were rioting? People weren't allowed to leave their work. 
COVID apps were flashing red. People weren't allowed to travel. I mean, it, it was really bad this time last year. And imports are down from that level. When we were told all last winter, January, February, March, that the China reopening was going to cause this big surge in demand and it was going to juice global economic growth. Nope, that did not happen. Now, again, that 0.5% increase year over year in exports, that's a big one. That's important. But then again, we got this comment from Walmart CEO. Hey, Walmart, kind of an important data point when it comes to U.S. consumers, don't you think? Walmart CEO says consumers may not be as resilient next year, even as deflation starts to show. There's that D word, deflation. In a CNBC interview, Walmart CEO Doug McMillan said consumer spending is tougher to predict next year because of rising credit card balances and dwindling household bank accounts. Deflation has bought down the prices of some general merchandise items, such as toys, he said. Lower prices will mean Walmart and other retailers will have to drive more volume. So deflation coming out of the mouth of the CEO of the biggest retailer in the world, it's kind of important there, guys. I know inflation is still on everybody's minds and prices are not going down for your rent and your electric bill and your health care and everything else is still getting more expensive. But we're starting to see deflation in discretionary things like electronics, TVs, toys, things you don't need to survive, but things that make life better. Those prices are starting to go down because people can't afford to buy that stuff. They're spending everything they have on food and rent and utilities. So we are starting to see pockets of deflation in the economy, even as inflation continues and then in the necessities of life, which means, of course, that quality of life is just going down, all while people on CNBC and Bloomberg tell you, what's the matter with you? Everything is fine. Things are so good. Have you seen NVIDIA stock? Everything's great. AI is going to usher in this new era of prosperity for everyone. That's at least the messaging from mainstream finance right now. And also, let's take a look at this one here. Carson Block of Muddy Waters shorts Blackstone's publicly traded mortgage REIT. We're starting to get some, some more high-profile shorts against commercial real estate. And, you know, we've been talking about commercial real estate for over a year on this channel here. It's all been this thing on the horizon. Oh, it's coming. It's eventually going to get here. This slow-motion train wreck. It's starting to get a little bit more mainstream with Muddy Waters weighing in on this. The short sellers said that the trust may face a liquidity crisis. Block said the REIT has extended maturities on its loans. Carson Block said he's short Blackstone Mortgage Trust, saying the publicly traded real estate investment trust is exposed to a perfect storm of economic conditions hitting commercial real estate and may face a liquidity crisis. The Blackstone Mortgage Trust, ticker BXMT, makes loans collateralized by commercial real estate. Block, who had short-selling firm Muddy Waters, said the trust is facing a possible liquidity crisis and may default on its loans, and he expects it will have to cut its dividend by at least half. That's not a small dividend cut, by half. There's been a lot of extending and pretending when things have been backed by paper profits, Block said in an interview. Speaking on the sidelines of the SOM Investment Conference in London on Wednesday, it'll be the second half of next year that will really start to see losses. So he's about six to eight months out here. He's not saying this is going to start up next week. Again, slow motion train wreck on these as these loans mature and the borrowers hand the keys back to the lenders. This is not going to be a big overnight thing. He's saying it's going to take a couple of months here. Block pred predicted that the trust borrowers will be unable to refinance and repay the trust and will need to post more collateral. Even if the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, Block estimates that losses on the trust $23.2 billion net book value of loans could reach between $2.5 and $4.5 billion, meaning the trust's equity could be completely wiped out. Shares had returned about 14% so far this year on Wednesday, including dividends. The stock had fallen by about 6% to 21.12. And here's a look at the Blackstone Mortgage Trust down 8% yesterday to $20.68. So the market read this Muddy Waters report and said, uh-oh, uh apparently there's a there there, and they started to sell this thing off. Uh, guys, I would just add the forward dividend yield for this is 11%. That is not a sustainable dividend level, not even for a mortgage REIT. So I, I would say he's probably right here. We're looking at a dividend cut in the future. How big remains to be seen, um, but you guys you, you've seen what I've covered on this channel. I am certainly aware of the commercial real estate issue that's going on here, and 
It's just a matter of how fast will the Fed lower if they lower how long do rates stay as high as they are? The clock is ticking on commercial real estate. There is trillions of dollars of loans against offices and retail properties and multifamily residential. All of those loans mature over the next year and a half to two years. And as those loans mature, they either need to be paid back or they need to be refinanced. Well, they can't pay them back. The people who borrowed the money don't have it to pay them back. And you can refinance them, but you're going to be refinancing into a higher interest rates which means your payments are going to go up, which means you're probably going to default one way or another. And so a lot of these borrowers, because a lot of these are non-recourse loans, when the money doesn't get paid back, you can't go after the borrower's other assets. All you can do is repossess the building. Well, the borrowers are saying, here's the keys, have fun. I'm walking away from the loan. And that leaves the lenders holding the bag. Blackstone Mortgage Trust is one of the biggest lenders in that space. So keep an eye on that story also. And last but not least, Reverse Repo Watch. Currently at $846 billion. That ticked up for the last couple of days. We hit a low of $768 billion last Friday. Now we're up to $846. So we're up by about $80 billion bucks in reverse repo, still within the noise of the chart. But it's this one that I want to draw your attention to. This is the repo chart. We haven't talked about this one in a long time. Overnight repurchase agreements. Uh, re a reverse repo, guys, is when you send cash to the Fed and the Fed hands you a U.S. Treasury to hang on to for a day. And then the following day, you give them the Treasury back and they give you the money plus a little bit of interest. A repo is where you give them a Treasury and they give you the cash. And then a day later, you give them the cash back plus a little bit of interest and they give you back the Treasury. So the repo is starting to show a little bit of noise in the chart. Now, this is not a lot, guys. We had a little tick up here to 0 0.201 billion. So $201 million or $200 million were borrowed by somebody in the repo market. And that was on Tuesday. Now, the reason why this is important is let's extend this chart all the way out to, say, the middle of 2020. No, almost nobody has been using the repo window. I mean, here, here's that move from yesterday, that $200 million, nothing here, right? Occasionally, a little bit of noise. For all we know, this is the Fed trading desks just making sure it's still working periodically here. But now we're starting to see a little bit of movement in the repo market, all right? Now, again, not raising the alarm here. This is not an emergency. This doesn't mean somebody's about to go belly up. That just means that one player needed a little bit of temporary liquidity yesterday, and it's the first time in a couple of years. Now, I want to zoom out a little bit more on the chart to put that in perspective. This is what repo looked like in 2019. All of a sudden, that big spike from Tuesday, it just disappears into the baseline of the chart. This was repo madness in 2019. Remember September of 2019 when everything was going well, and then all of a sudden, the Fed started printing money and injecting liquidity via the repo markets? That was back here. That was how you knew a liquidity crisis was about to happen when the repo market went crazy in the fall of 2019, eventually culminating with the <laughs> that happened in 2020. So this $200 million spike in the repo market that you see here when you zoom in on the chart, that disappears in the noise compared to what happened in September of 2019. So we're still a long ways off from anything like that happening but it's worth keeping an eye on, guys. That's the first time in years that anybody has had to go to the repo window. So we will keep an eye on that story as well. A lot going on today, guys. But stocks are up because number go up. That's what they do. I want to say thank you, everybody, for having your coffee with the Melon Heads this morning. Thank you to my Patreon supporters for everything you guys do for the channel. There is a link down below should you feel so inclined. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. And until next time, live small and dream big.